Okay, hi everybody, um, and welcome to our faculty workshop for connecting with our students. Um, my name is Rachel Starr, and I'm full-time faculty with Gen Ed, and we have some guest presenters here as well, Deborah Backstrom and Noelia Gose. The um, premise of this is based on the alumni panel that was at the faculty training conference, um, and we were kind of inspired by that and wanted to kind of take some of the things that they said and discuss those in context and see if we could brainstorm to find ways to kind of incorporate some of their comments and suggestions within our own classroom. So some of the areas that we're going to cover are cultivating talent, um, encouraging our students, diverse teaching styles in the classroom, and personal communications. Um, so we'll play some snippets from the um, from that session um, and and kind of discuss those. Okay, so I'll go ahead and play a snippet now. Yeah. My favorite classes and my favorite professors were the ones that both challenged you to learn something new or do something different than what you would normally do. Like perhaps they had an extra requirement for the assignment or they would push your assignment a little further. Regardless of whether or not maybe you were doing the assignment and gave, gave you a better grade, they would just push you towards being the best that you could and cultivate the talent that you have. and give you guidance, whether in or out of class. For me, that made a big difference. And it made classes like the animation classes really, really, really fun. OK. So the alumni panel noted how faculty members um, had helped them to improve their work and cultivate their talents. So the question is, how do you help students improve and how do you use connections and resources to help students? And I'd like to start with Deborah Backstrom. Um, okay. Um, I actually, my, my technique is to really take very specific detailed notes of a student's work, either mentally or, or written, um, because rather than giving just general feedback of the work being good or bad, um, I find that if the student understands that you've really looked at their work and studied it closely, they're more willing to, you know, make revisions and, and listen to your suggestions. Um, so I try to zero in on what makes their work unique. So it might be their personal style of drawing, which is kind of fun, or the imaginative way they tell a story, or maybe they create like really fun original characters you've never seen before, or they have a real sense of humor in their work. You know, whatever it is, I try to zero in on that. Um, so that they know that I'm really looking at them and not just uh, making general comments that I make to everyone else or that I've made in previous classes. And it really does help. They really appreciate it. Um, and as for resources, absolutely, I, I refer them to our resources. But of course, I also try to find resources that are specific to them. Um, so like if there's something in their work they're struggling with, like one thing I get a lot because I teach courses where, um, you know, where the animated characters are acting. You know, and so sometimes they might have a wolf character, for instance, and they draw an image of a, a realistic wolf, which is great, it might be a beautiful image, but it's not really an animated character. So I'll try to find wolf characters that are animated that show human like emotions and gestures and how they can make their character, you know, come to life if they're struggling in that way. So whatever it might be that they're struggling with, I really go out of my way to find specific examples that will help them. Um, do any does anybody else uh, any of our attendees have areas where they um, are able to uh, help their students in this way? How how do you help your students improve? And um, we can unmute anybody if you can respond, of course, in the questions panel. But if you Correct, want you to respond in questions, but I'm happy to unmute everybody or anybody. Um, Okay, well, while we um, give a moment to 
to uh, have folks respond. Um, I just want to jump in. I, I'm coming from from Gen Ed, so it's a very uh, you know different department. Um, but I I um, also agree, Deborah, that that really going out of your way to find specific feedback on a student's work um, is is important. Um, it, and it shows that you're taking the care to actually, in my case, read, you know, read carefully, review their writing and their thoughts and their ideas. Um, and I really like the idea, uh, you know, and I, I do it sometimes, but I could do it more consistently of really trying to get a sense in my mind of what the strengths are of the students, um, students work and um, point that out to them. And I think that that's, uh, especially in the discussion, for our assignments, um, that's also, I think, helpful for other students as well, um, because some students struggle in my classes with visual description while other students excel. And if, I, if I'm pointing out the strengths of one student, um, the goal would be that it could help other students as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to teach script writing as well. So it's a similar thing with the written work as it is with visual work. It's just, you know, really pinpointing those areas where I'm I'm even impressed. But even if I'm not, I was like, OK, that's you're really on the right track here. And just being very specific about it because they wrote it. They're very close to their work and they understand, you know, if, if you're looking at it and you're saying something that's, you know, general or that's even wrong, you know, that you miss something, especially in written work, because it's easy to to read over it very quickly and miss things. And if they if they pick up on the fact that you didn't pay attention and that you missed something, I think you lose credibility with them. Mm. Okay. We have some comments in the questions panel. So Jenny says that in Art 1000, she agrees with Deborah because detail and detailed notes are important. And she also uses video, which seems to help. Um, and I'm curious as to how you use video in Art 1000, Jenny, so maybe you could kind of let us know. Um, and Jenny, if you want to speak, we could, un we could unmute you. Certainly. And Patricia also says, Patricia Martin says, that she gives video critiques on specific work to how to find answers and helping them kind of figure things out. So. Yeah, the video is really helpful because then you could show their work on screen and you can you know, I've been doing that a lot more recently, like with storyboards, like say you see how, you know, this image doesn't connect well to this and showing the visual story and you could use maybe a close up here or, and when they, rather than just describing it, when you actually, when they're seeing their own work and saying, oh yeah, most of them will come back and say, yeah, you're right. I mean, I can see where that's, you know, that's jumpy and I need to put something else in there. Okay. Um, Margaret says, um, she feels like she says this all the time, but she believes asking questions that help students think critically about what they're doing can have a tremendous impact. Students usually gain a sense of pride and ownership because um, they were simply not simply told what to do. So asking kind of questions that leads them that lead them to their own conclusions to get it correct. Um, and then Jenny says she's in a place where she can't actually speak but she walks through the students through their proposals using video. Um, Alexandra says that the use of video is very helpful. She teaches AutoCAD, so small demos on how they fix issues or how to use the tools correctly. And I think that's a great yeah, source of use for that in that course. Um, Mike Buttles says that I find discovering students' experiential habits and relating it to new ideas and change helps new relational and reactional points. Jenny says she goes back and forth between the artwork image and what they've written and then helps them provide additional analysis that way. And Natalie uh, Ruska says that using video she does live coding changes to show students how the right code can affect their website. Um, I think that these these are such great examples, and you know, as as we all know, there's a big push to using more video in the classroom, and it's great to see all of the different techniques and ways that 
um, faculty are using video and how you can visually make make your points. Yes. Um, Noelia, would you like to kind of weigh in here? Yes. <laughs> I was <laughs> thinking as you were talking, um, an example of, of something that is a little gesture that that uh, that that I made that really uh, hit home with the student. I had a student who was making a little um, character with um, like a three leaf uh, uh, thing on, on the face. I'm not sure how to describe it, but um, <clears throat> Uh, I happened to stump into uh, um, something like that in the real world. In uh, it was uh, I, I went to, with the family to a restaurant, and I saw it right there. Look, like that looks like what the project that the student was doing. So I immediately took a picture, and brought it back to the classroom, and uh, show it to the student. Hey, look at what I saw. The same concept you're using is was implemented here for you know for this. Uh, it was a uh, some, one of those papers that they put on the table, uh, you know, the, so you're into something here, you know, you see that your idea is even different because you're putting that into your character like a mask, which is it takes it beyond this. Uh, and this is a little character with as a leaf. That little gesture tells a student that I care about their projects, because if I didn't care, it's like, oh, my goodness, you know, I will forget about it once I close the computer. But this I told the student by just doing that. Hey, uh, you know your project is has value, and it matters to me. So here it is. You know all the ideas I'm giving to you are because I really care about it. And in terms of resources, um, one of the things I do for for videos is not only go on the student file, but I also go and and say, okay, let me find you some examples. So I'll be right back, and then I stop the recording right there go to Google and then find a visual example. So here's here's a column that I was talking to you about. Look at the detail here and how it reacts to the, you know, to the grain of the wood or whatever I'm, I'm showing, visual. So that way they, they have a visual example of what I'm saying. Uh, so that's another way that I use videos as well, just to show them several examples that they can view as I just critique their project. I also like to do small, uh, short uh, how to's, you know, this is how you can do this and this is how you can fix this. Or how about this? You know, you put you put this uh, this plane over here. How about this? Look, check it out. Look, look what I'm doing. I'm going to take this. I'm going to push it up uh, take this tool and, and look at look. This is an idea you can do. Uh, I used to have a very good mentor when I started teaching uh, a few years ago. <laughs> so he told me always try to find uh, on the best students. Try to find something good, uh, but I also try. If you can't find anything that that they have to improve, give them ideas of other things that you, they can improve. Because the, the students who are doing poorly, you will have a long list of things that you can tell them. Okay, let's let's work on this, work on this, work on this. This is how you do it, right? But the ones that are doing really good, uh, they also they also need that motivation, that extra you know extra care for the project. So how about you know making the character jump up and down, and then his his hair falls off? You know that would be a really cool gig. You know, so I, I got so uh, just just wanted to share that. <laughs> I don't want to talk too much. Thank you, Noelia. Okay, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next section unless anybody else has any more comments or questions I'd love to hear any other anything else um, I will move on to the next slide so the next topic is encouragement and the alumni panel noted how much it helped them to be encouraged um, not to give up and one student even commented that without that support he might actually have given up and uh, Hannah is going to play that snippet now. On a student, because, you know, we all learn differently. And that was given to me. And I believe it shows, you know, just with the success I have straight out of college. Um, it, it teaches you a lot. And I think that's the best advice I can give, which I know they are currently doing, is not giving up and pushing the students as far as they can go. Awesome.
Okay. So um, in that spirit, how do you identify which students need encouragement or create an environment where um, students can reach out to you? And also, what are different techniques that you use personally to keep students going? Noelia, would you like to start this one? Absolutely. Um, I use a lot of personal references uh, when I when I talk to the students. Uh, you know, I I first tell them let's keep it casual. Uh, you know, with respect within the the school environment, right? But I don't. I tell them, don't call me Professor Goss. You know, you just call me. You can call me Noelia. Yeah, that brings it to a, a personal level. Um, I also um, use uh, encourage empathy in the classroom. You know, the, the, it's like right now, um, I broke my toe like a couple of weeks ago. Right after that, I guess my immune system says shut down and <laughs> and I got sick. Right. So I, I'm not afraid of sharing that with the students. Hey, guys, I'm sorry. I'm sick. Uh, I, I broke my toe. Oh, my goodness. You you had you had a medical emergency. Are you doing OK? Showing empathy uh, is something that helps students uh, that feel cared for, so, uh, feel supported. And then after that, uh, that happens, you know, working on a plan to get them to to go back on track is also very needed. Because uh, right now I broke my toe, you know, I couldn't spend two hours on the computer before starting to cry myself. <laughs> so I can imagine when, you know, I relate to the students, I try to put myself in their shoes uh, when they have an emergency and uh, somebody dies, they don't want to talk about it. I understand that. Or somebody got sick, I got to the hospital. Uh, put yourself in the student's shoes and what would you do? What would you need at that point? And then after that, I will, I will let them know, you know, hey, listen, I, I'm sorry you're going through this uh, let's work on a plan you know how about you know more time to complete the class how about get to see the videos and post what you have right now and then I'll just go critique it I go a little extra step uh, when when something like that happens and they that will surely feel uh, make them feel supported okay does anybody have any Anything they'd like to add to that um, about identifying students who need encouragement, um, creating in that environment where they can reach out to you and techniques that you use. Um, what about students that kind of go silent? How do you guys handle that How, if, they, if they're not actually reaching out to you? Um, anything that you'd like to kind of add to this, we would love to hear from you. And again, if you want to be unmuted, I will happily unmute you. Um, well, while folks are, are typing their responses, I just wanted to chime in. Um, Rochelle, I know that we talked a lot about uh, using texting and, uh, you know, of course, yeah. not everyone is, is comfortable with that, but, um, you know, I personally find it a, a very effective way of reaching out to absent and silent yes. students. Um, because they're more likely to read a text than an email. Um, phone calls often aren't answered. And in a text, I can really be careful with my language to sound very, very friendly um, and, and concerned and try to eliminate any sense that, um, you know, I'm, you know, upset or judging them for not being in touch and that I'm more concerned and I want to help and that you, you can yeah. do, I, at least I find I can do <laughs> effectively in, 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 in a text and um, I've had a lot of Thank success. You. Yeah, I have a lot of success with text messaging. Um, I use Google Voice so they don't actually have my number um, and so they're, I'm texting them back and forth on that number and so that kind of keeps a little bit of a, you know, privacy and I can also turn off the app at night, you know, or something and then I'm not getting the notifications. Um, but it's, it's just, I really get a lot more responses through the text messaging. And also when I'm, I also get a lot more questions that way too. Um, once they realize that they can do that while, the, you know, I get a lot of uh, questions like while they're working on assignments and things like that. So we are getting some questions coming in, comments. Um, Jenny says that she calls, emails, um, 
and offers help and resources um, and connects with the ACs for further assistance. That's always good, especially if you're having trouble reaching them. Um, let's see, Alexandra says that um, I tell the students at the beginning of the course to always tell me if they're dealing with anything before it becomes out of hand. If a student misses two assignments, I email them right away and ask if they're okay. And if I don't hear back, I text. So Alexandra also uses texting. Um, Margaret says, I think we've been directed not to text students unless we have prior permission or they text us first. It was part of the cell phone use guidelines, if I recall. Okay. Um, I think I think that policy might have changed uh, because I, I checked in on that. and. I think it's okay for us to text students. Yeah, I was under that impression as well. I, I wanted says, to, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna continue reading the responses here. Um, Alexandra says she agrees with Noelia that empathy is important and she shares with them anything, you know, when she has something going on. And Mike is asking if anybody's using Grasshopper. I use it every time I call students. Absolutely. And then Klaus uh, commented on Remind, that Remind.com has free texting features and group texting as well. And I actually do use, I used to use Remind, um, but I found that students weren't really signing up as much. So um, I just kind of switched over to just texting directly via Google Voice. Jenny also says she's using um, Grasshopper, but it actually doesn't have a text feature, which is unfortunate. So, yeah, exactly, which is why I'm using Google Voice. Deborah says, um, I reach out to each student at the beginning of the class and continually check on them through the course and encourage them to contact me with any issues, concerns, or problems via email or through Grasshopper. I have a lot of students who like phone calls and texts. All right. So, Noelia, you were commenting. You were about. You were saying something. I'm sorry. Yes, I I wanted to bring up the intelligent agents in the classroom. That administrative mm -hmm. feature is very useful because sometimes um, we don't know who's missing in action. You know, unless we go to the grade book and go check. So um, I'm starting to use that, and I find it fascinating that you can email yourself or the student, call them by their name. Hey, hi, David. Uh, I notice you're missing assignments, uh, you know, whatever email you want to send, and you send it to yourself, and it reminds you, too, of following up with the student. That way, a student who disappears on you, it, you know, it doesn't fall through the cracks. So, so it's a good reminder of who's doing well and who's missing. Yeah, I totally agree. I've been using that a lot, too, and I really um, find that to be very helpful uh, in helping me kind of track that. All right, our questions panel has slowed down. Deborah, would you like to uh, weigh in on this issue? On this, um, yeah, topic? I would. I would echo most of everything what everyone is saying. Um, and back to who needs encouragement and how you determine who needs encouragement. I mean, I just go on the assumption that every student needs encouragement, even if they're, you know, really good and their work is stellar. I think uh, you know, Noelia alluded to that that you can always find ways to help them take it to the next level because there's always room for improvement. Yeah. So I, you know, I try to not forget about the good students while I'm focusing on all the, you know, the students that need help. Um, and yeah, of course, I think in, in addition to us reaching out to them, I think we need to, as someone else said, make it very clear that they should come to us as well. Because, you know, sometimes I have called students and when I get them on the phone, they've actually said, oh, I wasn't sure if I should bother you or whatever, but I have this question and it's probably silly. So I just really make sure that everybody understands no matter how silly they think a question is, they should absolutely bring it to me because it'll save them time in the long run because if they if they end up doing something wrong they're going to have to redo that work and you know it's it's just better to reach out to me as well as, as well as me reaching out to them um, and tone of voice I would just touch on because you know I, I know for me it gets very easy to just send out kind of rote um, you know reminders and things like that excuse me I'm burping <laughs> but um, but yeah I think I, I look back, I sometimes try to think about how when I was in school and how most instructors that I had, the bulk of them, 
you could tell they were kind of going through the motions and they were just, you know, doing what they had to do to get their paycheck. And, you know, they were nice. They were fine. There was nothing wrong with them. But you, you really do get the sense that, you know, once I'm out of their class, they're not going to think about me one bit, you know. Um, and then there was a minority of teachers who were just downright mean. And then there was another minority of teachers who you just knew really cared. You know, you could just tell. We, we all can sense it if somebody actually cares. And it's those teachers that actually, you know, work to change my life. You know, like um, I remember in, in junior high because I like to draw and doodle and some teachers would get upset with me because I was drawing and doodling during, you know, their classes. But one teacher actually, um, well, she was an art teacher, so she understood. But, you know, she actually had me in junior high, like co-teach the class with her, which really inspired me in my artwork. And um, and then in creative writing class in high school, I had a teacher who, you know, he really saw me. He really understood my abilities and my talents and my passion for writing. And he took such special you know, interest in my work and encouraged me so much that it ended up changing my life because then I went into writing, you know, so I guess I just try to keep in my mind that I want to be one of those teachers. So even when I'm having a bad day and I'm not, you know, and it's very easy, especially with because our classes go so fast, it's really, really easy to just get into the going through the motions mode. And so I just have to step back sometimes and, and you know, really try to focus on, on these people as individuals. So one technique I use is, you know, when I'm starting, I, especially now because in Brightspace, we see the, the um, students' photos. So I try to really look at each photo and associate it with points in their biography. And I, you know, maybe it's because I'm a writer, but I try to write a little story in my mind of what, the, what this student's life is like. You know, like I work at the Home Depot in Idaho or, you know, or I'm in, um, I'm in the military and I might be away from class because I might have to go and, you know, be deployed on something. You know, I really try to, to imagine their lives and then I imagine what made them come to AI. You know, what are their dreams and goals? What do they hope to get out of this? Because I think just like we get into, you know, going through the motions, I think they do too. And so sometimes it's good to try to remind them, you know, like, what, why did you start, especially when they're, when they're disappearing you know, to somehow get that communication going of like why they started this, what they want to get out of it, what their hopes and dreams and goals are, to try to get them back on course, you know, to to fulfill those dreams. So that would be my addition. <laughs> okay. Um, Doug has a question. He says he's curious what people think about the alumni students who stated they won challenge, and didn't like flattery or low expectation. They remembered most the teachers that challenged them the most. Yeah, we actually kind of getting into that just a little bit um, to um, how some of that uh, comes into play. So, yeah. He also, Doug also has encouraged our use of um, intelligent agents. Um, So diverse teaching styles was something that came up. The importance of diversity in teaching styles amongst teachers was noted by members of the panel um, as being part and, you know, kind of an important part of their success. And so Hannah's going to play a snippet for us now. I can honestly say I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the wonderful group of instructors uh, I was fortunate to have. Um, each of them were so diverse in their teachings and their um, learnings. Um, they all experienced different backgrounds and they really brought um, so much to the classroom being willing to share their experiences and being able to really guide students um, to the best. And, and I just have to say the constructive criticism uh, part, uh, they were very good at that. Uh, they always encouraged you to do more, pushed you to do more. Those were the ones that did stand out to me the most. Okay, so um, Deborah, I'd like to hear from you on how you've developed your own teaching style how you convey that through the classroom, and how your unique, unique teaching style helps you make these personal connections with your students. 
Yeah, I think um, it comes down to respect. You know, again, back to seeing the person as an individual, you know, rather than just a name on a roster, <clears throat> and respecting whatever their background might be, whatever their interests might be. Um, and, and also, of course, students all come in at a different level. Some are very, very basic in their level. Others are quite advanced. So as Doug was saying, you need to challenge them at whatever their level is. Like I wouldn't necessarily challenge a student who is just, you know, very, very much a beginner. I wouldn't challenge them to do highly professional work, but I would challenge them to take their work to the next level so that they can build on those levels. Whereas a student who's already doing very nearly professional work, which I have some of those, then it's just a question of you know, maybe showing them examples of what actual professional work looks like so they can they also can take it to the next level. So wherever, I think it's just meeting them where they're at, you know, rather than looking at them all the same and saying, okay, you're at this level, this is where you should be, or this is where your next level should be. Um, and then, of course, you know, we do have some students that um, have their own special needs. Like for instance, a, an example I just had um, recently was the, the task was for them to record video of themselves doing various um, gestures and facial expressions that they would then use to draw their characters to act out these for, for animated characters um, and I had one student who she's a brilliant student really good really great artist um, always on time with her work you know you would think that she's just top of the line but she wrote to me in a panic saying that she you know was bullied in school um, and she's absolutely terrified of showing herself on video or talking on video um, because, you know, she's a bit overweight and she, you know, I thought she was fine, you know, but, but anyway, sometimes you have to like bend the rules a little to make allowances for someone and she's a good student and I didn't want to make her uncomfortable. So I said she could submit her videos directly to me rather than posting them in the classroom. Um, and, and then she could submit her drawings in the classroom. And I think from, I don't know, maybe that's against the rules, but I thought that was okay for her because it relaxed her and, um, and her artwork was stellar. You know, so it's just kind of, I think just again, down to seeing each person as an individual and, you know, whereas somebody else might be really cocky about their work and maybe overconfident about it. And in their case, you know, you might want to push them more or challenge them more so that they see that they're not perhaps as, as wonderful as they think they are or they are, but they need to go to the next level. So um, yeah, those are just some of my techniques that I use in that regard. Um, I agree with that. I think it's important to kind of, when they, um, when the students are showing talent or showing that they have met, easily can meet the minimum standards for an assignment to kind of give them an extra challenge um, so they can take take it to the next level. Or um, in some of the gen ed classes, I find that it adds just a little bit more interest to the assignment as opposed to just kind of doing, you know, the you know, writing about it. If, if, it's, if, if writing isn't challenging for them, then maybe bringing more into the subject matter, the content, to kind of encourage them to kind of dig a little bit deeper. And I think that they do, uh, they seem to appreciate that. Um, yeah, and if, and if you so can touch on something that they're passionate about, like finding, discerning what they're really interested in and how you can apply that to the assignment or task so that, so that they do start to take ownership of it and have more passion for what they're doing, that helps a lot too. Yes, yes, exactly. How about you guys? How what do you guys do to kind of um, push the students a little bit to bring them around? And also, how do you sort of um, maintain your particular teaching style and use that as a way to kind of bring um, the most out of the students to get more out of them? Um, I'll, I'll just step in as as folks are writing. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach here and talk a little bit more of a self-centered or um, uh, idea, which is which is that I I really love conveying what I find most interesting about what I'm I'm teaching. And so again, I'm in Gen Ed, and there are certain historical time periods that students really struggle with, um, like Paleolithic art, cave painting. Um, but I absolutely adore and I have found to be really fascinating. And so I find in terms of my own, I, I, I try to, I try to, I try to um, convey information that I find personally interesting, um, especially when I can see that students kind of 
have a resistance to it. Um, and it's with the hope that that will engage, the students will catch on, catch on to my enthusiasm um, and will engage them a, a, a bit more. Um, sometimes it's super effective and sometimes it, it, it doesn't work. So it's, it's flipping it a little bit um, in terms of following what I find interesting and really trying to express that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, when you show your passion for a subject, it does help encourage the students to sort of um, maybe see it in a different light if it's not something that excites them before, you know, hopefully. Okay, Margaret says that she learned to focus specific learning outcomes um, instead of pointing out everything that needs to be improved. So I don't throw too much at them at once. It helps them focus and they don't feel beat up, okay? I kind of do something similar when students need, when they're further back, I try to kind of focus on one area um, and add to that, like each assignment, so they continue hopefully to improve, but not trying to, you know, just like you say, not, not beat them up all at once. Um, I think it helps their confidence. Does anybody else have comments about this? Anybody want to be unmuted? Um, I would just say one thing about uh, the many of the courses particularly i teach a pop culture course and the project that they're working on is um fairly nebulous the first couple of days when they're starting to look at it mm -hmm. um so what i've done for years is provide exemplary work by previous students who at the end of any given course when i see something that is truly outstanding i will go out of my way to let that student know and also request that I can use it as an example. And I've never had anybody say no. And most often they feel uh, as though that's confirmation of all the effort and work that they put into the course. Yeah. And that provides a, a source of mutual emulation for the students who are coming into the course and seeing what they will be able to achieve over a five and a half week period which is very difficult to imagine when you're just jumping in at the very beginning. Um, and I feel that that reduces a lot of their stress and worry because they can see something to model their own work on and something to strive yeah. for. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Okay. Um, Mike says that students will genuinely get excited when you show your passion. Um, he works in hospitality and culinary history area and finds that all too often anything that occurred prior to 1980 is often seen as a foreign landscape. Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> That's true. Um, so, but yeah, I, I do agree that students get excited when they feel your, if they can feel your passion, it helps them. Alexandra um, also says the same thing, that, uh, that showing passion can encourage the students. Um, she said, I've taught courses on building codes, which is fairly boring. Um, but by showing my interest in adding things that I find interesting in the codes engages the students more. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and Natalie says that she sends out midterm emails letting students know what's ahead and providing the option for a meeting with me. It seems to help with the problem of the week four to six email when the student is panicking and they didn't know that their grade was low and they're going to fail. So in the midterm email, she provides them with personalized ideas on how they can bring up their average in the next half of the class. If they're doing well, she also lets them know then. Um, and some of the classes, I know some of the gen ed classes actually have a midterm check-in uh, built into the course um, to help with that. So I think it's great, um, great when you do that, even if it's not part of the course. Um, and then Alexander also says that if there's an opportunity, she likes to include current events, specifically in a codes class. Okay, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I can see where that might be um, uh, relevant, especially to a building codes class, to include things that might have happened uh, recently. You know, like 
fires or other things that might be kind of impacted by code. Kind of helps them see how that would be applied or how it can impact through real life application. Okay. All right, Noelia, would you like to weigh in here? Absolutely. Um, in my teaching style, I'm. Um, I often laugh because <laughs> I I smile a lot in real life. You know, I have two young children, so. Um, is part of my personality. So I'm not scared of making a student a video and, oh, wow, oh my goodness, look at what I did here. Uh, it would have helped if I, have, if I had clicked this here, right? And then I laugh about it. Um, I even have students who, who have told me, I have some of your videos and I remember you laughing. So I just go and watch them and it's just, it's, just, uh, it's memorable. So that is, be yourself, right? Um, one thing that has helped me a lot is, um, the feedback on uh, using the sandwiching method that, that is discussed uh, in some of the webinars uh, where you present something positive at the beginning and then go into what could be improved. If there's nothing to improve, then I give ideas, right, to like exemplary students. Uh, hey, how about changing this? What do you think of this? Oh, look at this video. Uh, do you, don't you think that that might, might trigger something or, you know, like a, maybe a, a change for your project? Uh, what do you think of that? Uh, and then close with a uh, encouraging statement. And I use a lot of let's do this or hang in there, uh, hi gang, let's do this, you know, a, a little bit, not, not to sound like a cheerleader, but like I'm part of this, I like we're together doing this like a team. Uh, positive encouragement. I don't know if um, uh, I've seen a, a TV show called uh, Brain Games uh, that uh, talks about that. Um, it, it, it shows how you can trigger a positive reaction from a person when you first open up a statement with a positive remark. And I try to apply that to my classroom feedback as well, because if the student is more receptive to listen to what I'm going to say next, uh, it, it's just I just have half of the battle, you know, to, to my side, because then I, I know that they're going to be a little bit more open to implement the changes to make their work a little bit better. So the sandwiching technique and uh, on feedback is very helpful and humor. You know, I'm not saying to be a jokester, but you can laugh here and there. <laughs> you can, uh, you know, just make the student know that you're human. That, that helps a lot. Okay. Yeah, anything that you can do to let them know that you're a real person there is is kind of helpful, I think. And and I think laughter is a great great way to make a connection with with uh, anybody. So, all right, I think our question panel has slowed down a little bit. Um, so moving on to the next um, slide, which is about personal connections, which we've been sort of talking about all along, but most of the members on that panel noted that having that personal connection with their faculty member was a big part of their success. So Hannah's gonna play the snippet. continue pursuing that connection between teacher and student, whether through video or recorded reviews. Like it was said before, sometimes the written reviews doesn't have that amount of emotion or passion, and it sometimes feels disconnected. And sometimes people don't express themselves as well as they do through speaking. So trying to record yourself, even if it's just a little audio clip or sharing screenshots with a little audio clip would really help keep improving that connection and just make it feel like there's a person on the other side because sometimes you forget that. So Noelia, I'm going to start with you this time. What are the ways that you create the personal connection and how do you personalize instructions or feedbacks to, to students? Um, any kind of technology that you recommend, like video, um, any kind of content. And we already talked a little about tone because you mentioned laughter. So um, I'd like for you to expand a little on that and just sort of um, let us know how you go about doing all of this. Uh, okay, that's uh, that's cool. I, I do use um, 
Uh, I, in my faculty profile, um, I put a uh, fun picture of myself uh, wearing a, a steampunk outfit uh, with a weapon that was, uh, it's a Nerf weapon that's customized. And uh, I just tell the students right there that, you know, I do a little bit of uh, role playing uh, whenever I can. Uh, so that that just shows the students, you know, I, I'm here, I'm a teacher, but uh, it, I don't have to be like all the way up there, uh, you know, it kind of comes across a little bit more more like a fun personality. Um, I laugh a lot, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not worried about using a little bit of, you know, positive humor in the classroom. Um, I also sign my, uh, my uh, communications uh, very often with smiley faces, which adds a little bit of positive on the, on the tone that you write. Uh, when, when you type, like the student said, there's on written form, sometimes you lose a little bit of the tone. So I like to, you know, sign with a little smiley face and uh, leave it there right under my signature. Um, and, uh, you know, other than the, the technology, for, uh, technology wise, I use, uh, I encourage the students to follow after, especially after the, um, the portfolio classes to, hey, find me on Facebook and let's, let's stay connected uh, and fi find me on LinkedIn. And uh, I, I would like to keep in touch with you after graduation. I, I don't want to see you disappear. And things like that, uh, they enjoy. And actually, the student who who presented on the clip that you mentioned, uh, she wasn't even my student. I connected with her via Facebook after she graduated because she was on the uh, cer graduation ceremony. And her and I just clicked. Uh, I don't know, don't know why. You know, she's she's she just started email te texting back via Facebook, and that little connection just creates a little bit of a, a personal approach, even if it's after after school. So I do have my uh, school account for Facebook, and then I, t I encourage students to find me there, and uh, be positive. You know, I. I am 100% uh, advocate about positive reinforcement. Uh, students get more receptive about, hey, let's uh, let's do this. You know, like, like you have a good, uh, you know, good approach here, and I want to see you get this to the next level. And then, you know, where, tr start with a positive <laughs> way to to reach them, and that way they they feel that that you really are there, that you care, and um, and that's it. I, I this this week. Uh, just uh, emailing students, say, hey, how's, how's it going? I haven't heard from you. Uh, are you doing okay? You know, uh, how are we doing here? And uh, that little extra step that you take of either uh, emailing them or texting them even f via Facebook through your school account um, makes a difference, makes an impact on them. Positive one. <laughs> okay. Um, I, that, that all sounds great. Does anybody else have any comments? Um, about uh, creating that connection, making the connection and personalizing things so that they feel connected to you. Um, I'll just jump in while folks are are typing and just um, say that I I do find phone calls um, you know as Rochelle as you had mentioned Jen Ed has a, a midterm check in where we have mandatory phone calls to our students um, and um, I, it's it's a lot of work um, but it's I think for me personally one of the most effective ways of of connecting with students is to actually talk to them. Um, on the phone. Um, I know that doesn't have to do with uh, specifically with feedback um, no, in the classroom, it, but it's, yeah. it, it, it helps. I, yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, and yeah, the students really find it helpful to hear your voice. And, you know, with, with Gen Ed, especially when we do the markups on directly on their papers, they might open up their paper that we send back to them and see a lot of red marks on there and get discouraged. So sometimes just being able to talk to them and say, you know, hey, you know, it's not, you know, really kind of focusing on the positives, um, 
and bringing your tone of voice into things and, you know, kind of letting them know that it's not just, you know, that there's more to it than just, yeah, here's your paper, fix these things, you know, um, it's, you know, that you're, you're, you're interested and concerned about them. And so the phone calls make a big difference in that respect. Um, Alexandra says that in her intro, she includes hobbies and professional achievements in addition to her professional achievements. Students um, will often email to ask about something um, that she's interested in or something she's involved in. And I think that's that's a probably a, that's a good thing to kind of always, you know, incorporate a few personalized things. Um, I um, I do that. I talk about my dogs a little bit. So, you know, that seems to help bring in um, initially some conversations about, you know, their own animals or their love of animals if they don't actually have animals or something like that. Um, and Jenny says that in her bio, she links to her cat's Facebook page <laughs> and students often remark about it. I can imagine, that's great. Uh, that's definitely an icebreaker and a way to kind of personalize things. Does anybody else have anything special that they like to do? And Margaret agrees that talking about pets is always a hit. It is. It can really kind of lighten the the tone a little bit, personalizing things like that. Yeah. So while you guys are still thinking about this, uh, one thing that I'm trying in my Art 1000 class is um, the um, is is because we do I do a lot of written um, feedback. We were just talking about how Gen Ed does that, and so in Art 1000, it's very often their very first class, and so when they see all that feedback, um, again, like I said, it can be intimidating. So what I've been doing is including a short video with that written feedback that explains how to read it. And, you know, I'm, I'm using an encouraging tone. Don't be alarmed at the number of little red marks here. It's, um, you know, and that sort of thing. And bringing in a couple of little jokes and trying to make it a little more fun. And I got a pretty good response with my milestone one final submissions. So, again, the class just started, so I'm still working on this. But I did want to kind of mention that. So, okay. And let's see, we had a comment that says, I want to mention about sharing Tips and ideas for staying focused, organized, and motivated as it relates to individual student situations and maintaining a creative mindset. It's a good idea, letting, uh, letting them know how to kind of keep that focus. It's a good point. Doug said, record a short video in the gradebook after completing the rubric. It lets the student hear encouragement from you directly and can put their scores in context. That could be very helpful. Um, and again, like you said, provides encouragement. Um, and Patricia says she likes to ask what their future plans are and how their degree can help them. I like that too, it kind of brings in a little bit more about them. And Mike says, I seem to have a lot of funny stories that relate to the subjects I teach. I find they not only work as good icebreakers, but are tools to relate to student experiences and the places that they've been. And Doug Markey followed up his comment, uh, Doug Barkey followed up his comment to say a video note. Yeah, that would make sense to kind of explain the um, grading rubric. Okay. Deborah, do you have anything to kind of wrap this up on this particular um, topic? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot of students that friend me on Facebook or LinkedIn, I would say almost after every class. And I, you know, all that we've been talking about, I think is, is what develops those connections or they feel some sort of connection to you. Um, and I think it is just about being genuine, uh, like Noelia is as well, you know, just projecting warmth and positive energy. Um, and they do respond to that. And then uh, just in terms of techniques, I mean, again, back to those bios, like I try to um, find something that I can relate to in their bio. For instance, if they, um, a, lot of, a lot of my students, because I'm in animation, they'll say, oh, I love anime. So rather than just letting that pass, I'll just like, oh, what's your favorite one? Like, I really like Black Butler, you know, and, or some other thing that I like, or, or if they like, um, 
British humor, you know, I was like, oh, you know, are they like Doctor Who? Like I can, I can relate to that and say, oh yeah. And I go to Comic-Con every year and I see these panels and it's just what, whatever it might be. And pets are a big one because I have a little toy poodle. So if they have a pet, you know, oh, what kind of dog do you have? What's his name or her name? And, you know, mm. I have a toy poodle. So it's, it's back to what we were saying before, but it's just, you know, for each bio, just trying to find something. Thankfully, I have a lot of range of experiences and, and, and as, as we all do and interests. So there's almost always something that you can connect to the other person or even the area they live in. I'm from Wisconsin. So if somebody is yeah. from Wisconsin, like, oh, what part are you from? You know, that kind of thing. So it's, it's just really creating those kind of relational connections. And they do remember you for that. Right, right. I like to comment on students when they have, when they live in places that I've traveled to. Mm -hmm. I'll bring up something that I enjoyed there, maybe some sort of a restaurant or something or, you know, or some building that I found interesting, whatever, you know, just something that's in their area. And, you know, when I can to kind of connect a little bit. Yeah, they really, they're, they're usually delighted by that connection. They're so surprised that you even noticed it or that you even read it and that you're coming back to them with questions about them and their life and their interests. Yes, and it makes them just feel, feel the light in their voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that they're, they're, import, they're an important part of the class and makes them feel that. Um, and then Natalie says, that reminds me, having traveled through the U.S. in my motorhome, I'm able to identify where they're from most of the time. That's, yeah, and saying, oh, I've been there. And then um, Mike says that he has a Maine Coon, which is a type of cat um, named Henry, who weighs in at 30 pounds. And one has to work hard to feed that beast. So he, you know, that's part of his discussion with the students, personalizing. So that's a big cat. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Alexander says hers is 27 pounds. Wow. Land of the big cats. Um, all right. So we are wrapping, getting close to the hour. So I'd like to know, anybody have any other questions or comments um, about any of this? And, you know, really love to hear from you. And Natalie would like to see pictures of the fat cats. So, um, <laughs> and you see that does kind of make a connection. So when we start to talk about our pets. Um, any questions or comments? Anything that you, we're going to do something similar in the fall? So, if there are anything, anything that you'd like to maybe bring into the discussion, have us bring into the discussion for next time, that would be a um, great time to kind of um, doing it to do this. Okay. Uh, somebody says, and I'm sorry, it just says waiting for names, so I'm not sure who's saying this. Setting up a weekly, uh, a quick weekly Q and A session over um, a hashtag online coffee where students can stop by and ask whatever they want in an informal manner helps a lot. So rather than office hours, more of a okay, that kind of sounds interesting. Oh, it was Renata. Okay, thank you, Renata. <laughs> I appreciate it. It just says waiting for names. I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> okay. So any other comments, questions? Thank you, Jenny. I hope this was really helpful for you. I found it to be very enjoyable. And um, like I said, we will do this again in the fall. So um, with different panelists and try to expand a little bit. And I hope um, that is, you know, I hope that you know, maybe to see you there too. So there is development credit given for participation on this workshop. No quiz is necessary here. And um, as a general reminder, your um, this is July, so you will see your training reported in October if you look at the chart. Okay. And Mike says we should do this more often. I agree. I think it was a great session. So I hope you guys did too. Thank you so much all for coming. And I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap this up. Thank you. You guys have a wonderful day and a happy 4th of July. Thank you. Thank you.